Hello everyone. In this video, I'll be talking about uh, section 2.3, limit laws. Um, so big picture limits eventually are going to get us to the derivative. The definition of the derivative really it requires that we understand what the uh, limit is doing. So that's really the big picture why we're discussing limits. Um, within the idea of limits, there are certain laws. It's kind of like the arithmetic rules for limits uh, that you can perform so that you can more readily evaluate a limit. So here is a whole list. This is on page 14. There are 11 here, and then we'll see a few more later. But here's what I mean by the arithmetic of limits. So if you have the limit of a sum, so if you have this limit going from x to a, approaching a, then if you have the limit of this sum, then that's totally equivalent to the sum of limits. Okay? If you have the difference of functions inside of a limit. That is, if you have a limit of a difference, then that's equivalent to the difference of the limits. So you can kind of break up this work into this work. If you have a constant, and that constant doesn't depend on x at all, which is the variable that the limit cares about, then that constant can come out front. Right, you can just kind of, through multiplication, right, it's multiply here, move that constant out front, and then just simply evaluate the limit and then multiply afterwards. If you have the limit of a product, then you can change that into the product of limits. If you have the limit of a quotient, then you can change that into the quotient of limits where the denominator is not zero. Other more arcane examples, but they'll come up. Um, if you have the limit of this function and that function is raised to a positive integer power, right, so that n needs to be a positive integer, then you can actually bring the limit within that power. So you can basically, instead of doing the power and then the limit, you can do the limit and then the power. If you have the limit of a constant, that's just the constant. If you have the limit of x as x approaches a, that's just simply a, and so on. Um, basically, this substitution principle, which we'll see in a second. If you have the limit of this power function as x approaches a, then that'll just approach a to the n. Um, number 10 here, if you have the limit of this nth root, where n is a positive integer. So this could be like a square root. Um, what this is saying is you can just replace again. So you can just, if x is approaching a, then this will be the nth root of a. If you have the limit of the nth root of some function, you can actually bring the limit inside of that nth root where n is a positive integer. Let's see some examples. I'll try to keep this video shorter than the previous one. Um, so here we have, it says the limit of 3x squared plus 5x plus 3 as x approaches 2. So it says evaluate each limit uh, using the above limit laws. So we have, just to kind of identify what we have here, we all look at this this way. So this first limit law is kind of taking place, right? We have a trinomial, but really this just extends into the trinomial case. So if you have the sum of multiple terms, you can just rewrite this as the limit as x approaches two of the first term. And then basically we're just distributing this limit operation amongst each term. So I'll say plus the limit as x approaches to of 5x, and then plus the limit as x approaches to 
of just three. Right? So that's kind of limit law number one, just to remind you. So that's this one. So the limit of a sum is the sum of limits. And now if I just identify this term right here, this is now similar to, if you can see this one here, right, number three. So since I have three times x squared, this three is acting like that constant c. So I can bring this constant actually out front. And same thing here with this five, I can bring this constant out front. Okay, so I've so far had like limit law number one. And then what I'm about to do here is limit law number three. And I'm looking at page 14 here. Check this term out. So the limit of a constant. So we have this one down here that said if you have the limit of a constant as x approaches some other number, then it's actually just the constant. So this term, because of limit law number seven, that's a seven, believe it or not, this is just going to be three. Okay, so I'll rewrite this. This will be three times the limit as x approaches two of now just x squared plus five times the limit as x approaches two of x plus just three. I can evaluate that one. And now this term based on limit law number nine, I'll just let you look at number nine, but based on limit law number nine, I can go ahead and evaluate this one. So I'll replace x with a two. So it'll be three times two squared. Because of limit law number eight, and looking at this term, I can replace x with two. So this will be plus five times two and then plus three. So adding that up, we get 25. Um, something to note, big picture, is this is not how I would do it in general. This, this is an exercise in understanding the limit laws. But in actuality, we could have just plugged in the two, right? 3 times 2 squared plus 5 times 2 plus 3. Notice that's what I eventually had right here anyways. In, in reality, I would just do it this way. I would notice, hey, there's nothing wrong with just plugging in the number. Whenever I plug in the number and get a number out, that's the limit. Right? That's something that I was saying in, in lecture 1, the video for lecture 1. All right, let's see another one. So I'm leaving part two open. So that would be one that you try on your own and then you're gonna watch, or sorry, you're gonna find the, the key to the rest of the problems next to this video. All right, so on to part three. Here's one, we're approaching two again. Not all limits have that X is approaching two, but the, part one and part three have been two. Um, so looking at the limit loss, this is a square root, right? There's a square there. So, um, number 11 says if that's a positive integer, which it is, then I can bring the limit inside. So that's what I'll do here. So in other words, instead of having the limit outside, I'll have the square root of the limit as x approaches 2 of 2 times x squared plus 1 over 3 times x minus 2. All right, so that's because 
I'm just notating for our information. That's because of limit law number 11 on page 14. And then because of limit law number five on page 14, so I'll just maybe notate it in here. So because of number five now, I can think of the limit of a quotient as the quotient of limits. So I'll say this is now the square root of the limit. X approaches two of two X squared plus one all over this limit as X approaches two of three X minus two. Gonna readjust the camera real quick. Sorry about that. Okay, so that is number five that I wrote in red, right? The quotient. And now I'm back to number one. Right? You don't need to notate all this, but just for our information, now we have the limit of a sum. I can rewrite that as the sum of limits. So the square root is still there. So the limit x approaches 2, 2x two squared, plus the limit x approaches 2 of 1 over. And this now is number 2. I'll let you look at page 14, but this is now number 2, limit law number 2. The limit of a difference is the difference of limits. So I can say limit x approaches 2, 3x minus limit x approaches 2 of just 2, right? That negative is now accounted for out here. Okay, and now replacing, so this would, this term right here would obey limit law number 9. Well, even before that, I'm sorry. It would obey limit law number 3. This now would be limit law number seven, this term. This term would also be three, and this term would also be seven. Hopefully you can see why I'm saying all that. So, a little tedious, and again, not how I would actually do this, but this is just to break down the limit laws. So that two can jump out front. So that's that third limit law. So two times limit, x approaches to x squared. And then the seventh limit law says if you have a constant, then it is just that constant that the limit is. So it's just plus one over, and then I can bring that three out for the same reason as, as this one. And then we have a constant, so this will be minus two. And right here, just to beat this into the ground, I guess, we have number nine, it looks like. Number nine, right? Yep. And then this one will be number eight. So I'm kind of leaving out the details this time, but okay. So square root is still there. And then two times two squared plus one over three times two minus two. Okay, so it looks like we get four times two, which is eight, eight plus one. So we get the square root of nine over six minus two for four. So it looks like we get three halves. Um, keep in mind, just to reiterate, if you ever can just plug in the number and you get a number out, then that is the limit. So could have just plugged in. There's ones where we can't, and we'll see what we can do or what we need to do in those cases, but I could have just said, okay, if we have the limit x approaches 2, let's just replace any occurrence of x with 2. 
So we would have the square root of 2 times 2 squared plus 1 all over 3 times 2 minus 2, and that's ultimately what we had down here anyways. Okay, so I don't want to uh, confuse the point. This, all this work in blue is so you can kind of see what is going on behind the scenes as far as the limit laws. In practice, as we move forward, you're going to want to take the limit as quickly as possible. Okay, so you're going to be doing really more, more things like this in red. Um, not in every case can you just plug it in. So we'll have other techniques and so on when that occurs. But just want to remind you of that. So what I've been alluding to is this direct substitution property. This is on page 16 now. Um, in the case that you can just plug in a number and you get a number out, you are done with the limit. And that's what this direct substitution property is, is attempting to say just a little more formally. Um, so plug in basically is the moral of this story. So plug in A, see if you get f of a. If you get a number out, then you're done. Sometimes you'll get a, an error, like a mathematical error if you plug in a, and we'll see what happens in those cases. And yeah, um, as far as double-sided limits go, for the double-sided limit to exist, the single-sided limits need to exist for sure, and they need to agree. They need to be the same value. So let's uh, evaluate some limits. Okay, let's just get more practice. So what do we do first whenever we come to a limit? So plug in. Okay, see if you get a number out. If you get a number out, you're done. So let's go ahead and plug in. I would have negative three, and then I need to square plus three times negative three all over negative three, again, squared minus negative three minus 12. What is that? So if you look at what that would be, we would have what? Nine minus nine over nine plus three minus 12. It looks like we have something like a zero over zero. And that's not a number. This is not uh, a number. Okay, so we need to do other stuff. So if that doesn't work, if plugging in doesn't work, then move to the second step. So do some algebra. And after that algebra, then plug in again. Okay, so the algebra part, I'll go ahead and maybe do over here. So I can factor, it looks like. These are a couple of factorable polynomials, right? Top and bottom. So I'll factor out an x up top. So I get x plus three. And then in bottom, if I factor it, it looks like I get x minus 4, x plus 3 as factors. So we actually have a simplification. Okay. So really, I could do this problem as the limit as x approaches negative 3 of x over just x minus 4. Right, what's left over here. So now I'm back to plug in. So if I plug in now, I would have negative 3 over negative 3 minus 4. This is negative 3 over negative 7. This is 3 sevenths. And that's the limit. Sorry. Okay, so the moral of that story is, yeah, we always want to plug the number in. 
If you get a number out, you're done. Next problem. If you don't get a number out, then you need to do some algebra. And the algebra we needed to do here in this case was factoring, canceling, and then reevaluating, right? In other cases, you might need to do other algebra, but still, often some algebra will work. Not always will algebra work. And that's where calculus will eventually come in, right? So, yeah, plug in, uh, do some algebra, plug in. And, and as many times as you might need. So I'm leaving part two open. So what's step one? So plug in. So if I plug in, it looks like u is approaching two. So I would have the square root four times two plus one minus three all over two minus two. So I would have essentially the square root of 9 minus 3 over 0, and already that's a problem, right? This is another 0 over 0, but anytime 0 is on bottom, this is really the issue. The 0 on top isn't, isn't an issue, really. It's the 0 on bottom that's the issue. So we cannot just plug in, in this case, and get a number out. So we're on to the do some algebra. Right, so we need to do some algebra. In this case, what I'm going to do is uh, use the conjugate. So what I'm going to do is multiply top and bottom by the conjugate of the numerator. plus three. Right? This is the conjugate. So go ahead and now carry out that multiplication. When using the conjugate, you're going to get a squared minus b squared always. Don't forget to write your limit because ultimately we're evaluating a limit. We're not just doing kind of, I don't know, algebraic manipulation. So here, I'll get um, just 4u plus 1, actually, and then I'll get minus 9 up top. And then in bottom, I'll just leave it actually as u minus 2 times the square root of 4u plus 1 plus 3. Okay, so I'll actually just leave it in factored form in bottom. So up top, uh, it looks like I would have negative 8, right, negative 8. So I can factor out. So I can say 4u minus 2, in other words, over u minus 2 times the square root of 4u plus 1 plus 3. And here is that thing that we're happy is occurring, okay? Usually there'll be some algebra that you do and then, you know, good things happen. This is, this is the good thing that happened in this case, this cancellation. So now limit u approaches to of just 4 over the square root of 4u plus 1 plus 3. And now if you imagine the 2 going there, so 4 over square root 4 times 2 plus 1. I'm using the direct substitution property at this point. And then plus 3. 2 thirds. 2 thirds. Okay. So that would be the limit in that case. All right, one more.
This is the squeeze theorem. So you're uh, going to see a bit of a proof. So what we want to do is use what's called the squeeze theorem to show that this occurs. Um, this, is a, <laughs> this is a complex looking thing. So the limit as x approaches zero of the square root of x cubed plus x squared, and then outside of the square root is sine of pi over x. And what we're trying to do is show that this limit is zero. So we actually know the limit is zero. We're not finding the limit. Okay, different from the ones we were just doing. We're not finding the limit. We actually know it's zero. It's not a trick question. But what we're attempting to do is to use this squeeze theorem to show that it's zero. Okay, and I'll let you read through the squeeze theorem. What I'm going to do is solve this, kind of using calculus and algebra, and then I'll, I'll kind of append, I'll, I'll, at the end of this video, you'll just see me on Desmos. If you haven't learned what Desmos is, I'm going to introduce you to Desmos uh, through this problem also. Please feel free to use Desmos throughout the semester. Okay, so we want to show that the limit of this strange thing is zero. The problem is, if you plug in, remember, we always want to just plug in if we can. <laughs> That's no different here. If, if we could just show this by plugging it in, we're done. So the square root of zero cubed plus zero squared times the sine of pi over zero, that's the problem, right? This is the problem right here. The division by zero again. So we cannot plug in, so we need other techniques. And the other techniques in this case isn't even algebra, it is this theorem. It's the squeeze theorem. So we, from trigonometry, know, so we have that if you have a sine function, the sine of anything, that the sine of something like pi over x, like what we have right here, just this piece of it, would be bounded between negative one and positive one, right? If you look at the sine curve, it just oscillates going up and down for eternity between negative one and one inclusive, okay? So this is a true statement. So we're kind of starting with something true and trying to build off of it. What we want to build is this, this entire thing on the left. Okay, so what I'm missing, or something that I'm missing, is this square root of x cubed plus x squared part. So what I'm going to do is take this inequality, this compound inequality, and I'm going to multiply through by the square root piece that I'm missing. So if I multiply through by it, we will have negative 1 times the square root of x cubed plus x squared. So in other words, negative the square root of x cubed plus x squared. Less than or equal to still. I'll explain why in a moment. <coughs> Excuse me. Multiplying through, I'll get one of those square roots here as well. So I'll have a square root of x cubed plus x squared sine pi over x less than or equal to and then square root of x cubed plus x squared times 1 is just the square root of x cubed plus x squared. So sometimes you have to switch inequality symbols, right, when you multiply through by a negative. In this case we don't have to switch anything because this is never negative. The square root is never negative. So I am, again, I'm trying to build this up. I'm trying to build that up right here in the middle. And we're calling it the squeeze theorem because I'm squeezing the thing that I care about in between these two other things that I can more easily 
uh, evaluate. So the only thing I'm missing is the limit. So what I'm going to do is attach a limit throughout and a limit where x is approaching zero. So we have the limit as x approaches zero of negative square root of x cubed plus x squared less than or equal to the limit as x approaches zero the square root of x cubed plus x squared times the sine of pi over x less than or equal to the limit as x approaches zero the square root of x cubed plus x squared. So check out what we have now. In the middle, let's use a different color. In the middle is the thing that we had on the left. So the thing in the middle is what we care about. We're trying to show that that is zero. We have squeezed it in between this function and this function. Check out what we have here, the limit as x approaches zero of this thing. How can we figure out this limit? How do we always initially try to figure out limits? Through plugging in, right? Same as what we initially tried first. So if you plug in the zero, you have no mathematical error, right? So zero cubed is zero, plus zero squared is zero, square root of zero is zero, negative one times zero is zero. So over here, if you evaluate the limit, you just get zero, right? Plug in zero. And what do you get? You get zero. So we would have zero less than or equal to the limit. I'm not plugging it in here because we can't. That's, that's the whole reason why we're in this mess in the first place. less than or equal to, so check this one out over here. Again, you can just plug in, you get zero cubed plus zero squared, that is zero, square root of zero, zero. Over here you get zero. Now, observe this. You have some number, right? This is some number. We're trying to prove that it's zero, by the way. But this is some number and it's in between, right? It's greater than or equal to zero, or it's less than or equal to zero, really, and it's less than or equal to zero, right? This number is both greater than or equal to zero, and it's less than or equal to zero. The only number it could be is zero. So in other words, the limit, x approaches zero of this thing we originally cared about, is zero by the squeeze theorem, I'll say. All right, hi again. I wanted to show uh, people Desmos. If you're not familiar, it's a free graphing calculator. Um, so go to desmos.com. Desmos, that's my daughter, by the way. <laughs> Desmos.com and enter, start graphing. And so yeah, regarding page 17, the squeeze theorem, example 12, the one we talked about, I wanted to kind of explain that a little more conceptually as well and also introduce you to Desmos. So the thing that we wanted to evaluate, so what you can do is, oh, make sure you can see the whole screen. So down here, there's this tool. Let me see if we can refocus. I think that might be better now. So I can click on the square root, and now x, I can use this little hat. I'll do my cubed. And just type type it in. It's pretty intuitive. Scroll outside, sine, and then I'll do oops, so sine parentheses. I think yeah, pi pi will convert to the p 
pi and then divide by x. You can see this, hopefully. Right? So this graph is popping up, kind of a strange graph. Um, that's the thing we care about, right? So we used the negative square root of x cubed plus x squared as a boundary on it, on an underbound on it, right? Just to remind you, that piece right there, okay? We're, we were saying that's always less than or equal to the piece we care about. And you can see, here's the piece we care about in red, and here is the function we attached, we squeezed above it, right? We also used the positive version. And you can see that in green is the upper bound, and it is squeezing the function we care about in red between it, but from above, right? This is the squeeze theorem geometrically. So here's the red one we care about. We can't find its limit algebraically very nicely. Here's the green one we know is an upper limit on it, or an upper bound on that function we care about. Here's the blue one. Maybe I can make this a little more readable. The blue one is a lower bound on the function we care about, and we can take the limits of the green and the blue one very easily. And because we know that those limits are boundaries on the limit we care about, we have therefore squeezed the limit of the difficult one in between the limits of simpler ones. And because the above and below both converge to this zero point, we know that the limit of the one that we care about also does. Okay, so this is Desmos, just a brief overview. You can kind of explore. Um, I'll talk to you next time. See ya.